week's column, um, I took a trip over to Delmore Woods. Um, those of you who know me know I don't tend to travel a whole lot, so a trip over to the east side of town is kind of a big deal. <laughs> and um, I got to tell you, if you ever want to see a commercial for planting native plants, take a walk along the border over there at uh, Delmore. Um, if you've not been there before, and I hope you have, but if you haven't, uh, Delmar Woods is uh, probably most easily accessed by uh, the Route 25 entrance. Um, it's maybe, I don't know, five blocks or so north of Main Street. And you go in on the um, turn right uh, if you're going north on Route 25. And uh, one of the things that makes Delmar Woods so cool is that it's, it's a community park, but it's got a lot of nature. Like when I when I first started here at the district in 2007, one of my uh, first programs was to um, I think I did a bat program at Delnor Woods, and um, I could not get over the amount of nature. There were there were bats for sure flying around, but there were also deer. Uh, there was a muskrat swimming in the pond. There was a green heron. Uh, there were birds calling in the trees. It's just it's a really nice mix of um, those natural features combined with some kind of nice modern amenities. There's a paved path, so Beautiful. people who uh, might uh, need to get around with some wheels can can move easily through the park. Uh, it's got a playground. Um, there's a drinking fountain all that's covered up these days. Uh, there's pink pavilions. Um, there's uh, just all kinds of things uh, to uh, keep people busy there. Now, um, but a along those paved paths, um, in fact, one of the paths actually goes through a uh, wooden stand. Um, the, the park, the original portion of the park that the park district acquired in uh, the late 90s was about 23 acres. And then maybe, I don't know, between five and say eight years ago, we doubled the size of the park by adding uh, additional acreage to the north. Now, some of that's not really um, accessible yet. There's some paths that people have punched through, but it can get a little rough going. Uh, I tried to go there one um, kind of steamy day last summer and ended up, I was hung up in the raspberry brambles and uh, got into some poison ivy. But um, the area is protected, and therefore the uh, the animals um, you know, they use it as kind of their own throughway. Uh, now, this picture we're looking at here, um, this is uh, a plant called bee balm, and uh, it's also called monarda. Some people call it wild bergamot. Um, Earl Grey tea. If you're familiar with Earl Grey tea, that is flavored with uh, bergamot, which is this plant here. It's, uh, you can crush the leaves, you can dry the leaves, and make tea out of them. But um, I, I was walking past uh, this stand of uh, bee balm, and I my eyes caught a little bit of motion. Um, can you see this little character here? Let's stop for a second. Oh, there it goes off to the uh, to the left. We'll let it go a little bit farther up oh, and stopped again. That's a hummingbird uh, clearwing moth. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, snowberry clearwing moth is what they call that. Looks kind of like a cross between a bumblebee and a hummingbird. Watch how it works these flowers though. It's going after the nectar and the bee balm. Uh, you know, it's going from, and I, uh, uh, here we go. I, um, I, I tried to take a picture of it. And now, you know, me and my limited photography skills, um, you know, I realized that I was just better off taking a video so you could appreciate it that way. It's going uh, from flower to flower, uh, maybe stopping for a second or two at each one up, oh, and then it goes to the back here, and who do we have but another nectar sampler. Now, this looks like a butterfly, 
And it kind of is, it's in the same uh, order, Lepidoptera, as the butterflies and the moths, but there's a little subset of that group called um, the skippers. And this is uh, actually a silver spotted skipper. Um, you know, butterflies, when they fly, they have a kind of a lilting, um, if you've ever watched a monarch try to fly across Randall Road, my goodness, gives me a heart attack every time I see one, but they, they don't move terribly quickly. Skippers are a little bit, um, they dart when they move. You can sometimes tell a skipper, even if you can't identify the species, you can tell it by its movement. Uh, you can also tell it by its antennae, which are uh, kind of uh, hooked at the top, uh, which is a little different from what we'd see in a butterfly or a moth. But let's this guy um, work the uh, proboscis there, or proboscis. I'm a Wheaton kid. I learned how to talk funny there. Um, I'm the only person I know who says proboscis. But um, it is dipping, and let's watch it again, um, working way, that's, that's really its tongue that would normally be curled up underneath and it's dipping in and it's sipping that nectar from the bee mom. Mm, 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 mm. There it goes on to another one. Um, in fact, you can see other insects flying around. Well, I filmed just these short video segments. There were literally hundreds of flies and bees. There was a bumblebee too that I was watching uh, visiting these plants. And this is just one native plant, a uh, stand of plants in one park in St. Charles. Just imagine if we were to, to plant uh, more native plants uh, around town, uh, the a variety and the amount of uh, nature that we could all see in our yards would just be phenomenal. Um, you know, there's a, a school of thought, uh, Doug Tallamy is a, a gentleman who, uh, he's written a few books now. Um, the book I've read of his is called Bringing Nature Home, and of course I'm drawing a blank on what his most recent book is, but uh, he has an idea that if each of us were to plant just a few, you know, set a little bit of our yards uh, over to native plants so that we're offering um, the, the plants that are, are adapted to growing in this environment and the animals that live here are adapted to using, uh, we could create um, one of the largest, or the largest national park in the country because all of our yards would kind of be connected and they'd be appropriate to uh, the particular climate that we were living in. It's a, it's a neat, uh, interesting idea. We'll probably explore that in a, in a future uh, good natured uh, hour. But it, I just, I stood here, I was absolutely mesmerized by uh, this bee bomb over at Del Nor Woods Park. Watch one more time, check that out. And again, I tried to take a picture, a still shot of the uh, skipper, but it just wasn't going to happen with my limited skills. Uh, now here's a, a nice uh, still subject, although it was a kind of a breezy day. Believe it or not, this picture took me like 12 tries, but um, you'll see this growing around the edges of the woods um, at Delnor Woods. It's called bottle brush grass. And, you know, there are uh, a lot of great plant people uh, here in King County really know how to identify uh, plants and, and grasses are, um, Really, some of the can be some of the more difficult plants to um, to identify. They've got a lot of the same parts, but they go by different names. They've got you know, what are these flower structures here, and they they create pollen and everything. But there are um, many different types of grasses. I find difficult to identify. But when you get a nice, easy, obvious species like this, it's nice to say, oh yeah, there's some. I know that one. That's bottle brush grass. Um, it prefers. Um, uh, woodland edges, um, and it, it's, it, you can go to a nursery and you can buy all sorts of ornamental grasses, some of which can actually become quite uh, weedy if you let them go, but, but we've got some nice uh, native uh, plants, uh, some plant uh, grasses that you can plant, including this uh, called bottle brush grass. Um, and then, <sighs> You might recognize, if you have been to Del Norwood, you might recognize this as the front pond in the park. Uh, I tell you, for years, for, for decades, uh, this is what the front pond at Del Norwood looked like. Now, um, 
And it was a dam uh, dates back, uh, I want to say to maybe the 1930s or so. Uh, this pond is actually fed by a drainage from the east side of St. Charles. There's a, a series of ponds uh, that um, this, this property was at one time uh, owned by the Collins family, which is related to the, uh, the Norses and the Bakers and you know, some of the founding names of St. Charles. Uh, they owned this property. In fact, what's now Del Norwoods Park at one time was uh, their uh, par three, private par three golf course. Um, and what's a nice chunk of property without a nice pond to look at? Well, if you know our, our local ecology, you know that ponds aren't really something that forms very naturally. We might have some ephemeral ponds, some low-lying areas that fill up in the springtime, but if you want a, a pond that lasts year-round, you either dig one or you dam up a creek. Um, and this, uh, this is the result of a dam. Now, um, for several years, the dam at Delnor Woods was failing. It was... It was um, made out of locally quarry dolomite uh, rock that's like limestone. They had a lot of leaks in it. Uh, and this water got kind of, it's also very silty in there because when you dam something up, the, the creek is going to keep flowing. It's going to keep bringing uh, sediment in. So, so this pond is quite shallow. The bond is, uh, bottom is very squishy. Um, it had this really healthy uh, covering of duckweed. Duckweed, um, you might look at that and you might think, oh, it's full of algae, but duckweed is actually a flowering plant. I believe it's our smallest flowering plant. Um, and if we were to look more closely at this, you'd see that all this green was made up of um, just millions and billions of, of tiny little green leaves, little green plants, and then the roots hang down into the water. Well, um, over time, this got to be uh, a source of complaints. Uh, people, the, the aesthetics of, we even tried uh, back in the, the Mary O days, there was even a, a sign explaining what this greenness was, an interpretive sign. But, um, you know, aesthetics being what they are and this pond being such a focal feature of this park, um, all this is gone now. Uh, because what we've done is we've put in an aerator. And by we, I mean the park district. Uh, I was kind of, I'd heard this was going in, but I have to admit I was a little surprised to see it. When you uh, come up to this, this pond, which is uh, right off the Route 25 parking lot, kind of sounds these days like you're uh, coming up to Niagara Falls. I mean, this, this thing roars. It is an enormous aerator. And you can see it's done um, what it was installed to do. There is not a scrap of duckweed to be found anywhere. Um, now, I'm going to go back again. You know, when the pond looked like this, it was, it was still and it was quiet, but a lot of times you would see trails in it. I think uh, there was probably one that went through here. Because turtles would swim through here, and ducks would swim through here, and muskrats would swim through here, and green herons would hunt here by the edges. Um, when I was there the other day, um, I didn't see a whole lot of wildlife activity. There was definitely the, the roar of the pond um, aerator going, but uh, I didn't see the green here. Now, it could be I just missed it. And, and over time, animals do get used to changes like this. They're probably actually more adaptable than I am. But um, this, uh, this was a, probably the most market change that I had seen at Delmar Woods in a really long time. Um, so if you like the, the sound of rushing water, uh, we've got that taken care of for you with a new aerator in the front pond at Del Norte. Now, one other thing, um, those of you who are longtime St. Charles residents, you can uh, probably help me out with this. This man was a physician for years. I'm going to say his name's Doc Miller. Uh, I do know for sure that his uh, dog is named Gracie, and, and if you're lucky uh, enough to get to uh, Delnor Woods at a time when he's walking there. Gracie is, is just, um, in fact, the two of them are kind of uh, walking icons of the park. Um, when we would conduct nature camps there, he would often come by with Gracie. Um, that would be in the morning, uh, you know, usually around 11 o'clock or so. This happened to be in the afternoon, about 2.30. 
Um, Gracie, I was actually, I was taking a picture of the bottle brush grass and I felt a kind of, a, somebody goosed me. And I thought, oh my goodness, who's, who's here? And it, well, it was Gracie. She just came over to say hi. She's super friendly. Um, from what I understand, she was a uh, service dog uh, dropout because she was so friendly. She didn't make it through the program because if you're a service dog, you've got, you know, you got to stay focused on your person, which you can see she is. But um, she, uh, she's just so friendly and so sweet. And it was such a, a blessing to be able to see the two of them there. Now, um, this is the asphalt path that I mentioned that goes through the park. Um, just around the corner here, there's a, a tree. Um, you know, the Park District has a memorial tree program, and uh, there's actually a, a tree with a sign. Um, Doc's friends went together, I believe, and bought this uh, tree for him, and there's a sign on that says, Golden Retrievers Welcome. Uh, and it's a real testament to these two. So again, if you're lucky and you uh, time your visit just right, you might be able to see them taking advantage of this, uh, this beautiful park that we have right um, just a little bit north of downtown St. Charles. Um, so we're going to now switch gears. Stick we're going to go from the lovely vistas and the, the uh, calming, quiet of uh, Elmer Woods, and we're going to have another round of why and I so So um, this week's topic came up. Um, well, I've been kind of feeling kind of itchy myself. Uh, and then I got a phone call the other day that confirmed what I think has been going on for a while now. Um, I don't know, is anybody getting anything that looks like these? Um, these aren't mosquito bites. You'll notice there's kind of a hole in the center and this hard, um, kind of like a crust that forms on the center of these raised dots. And um, you don't feel a bite when you first get these. Uh, it takes a little bit of time uh, before the itch begins. But then once it starts, it is so intense. I tell you, it drives you nuts. Anybody know what we're talking about? It's jiggers. It is jigger season. Um, I got a call the other day from um, a gentleman who's been a longtime volunteer with the Forest Preserve District, and he could not believe it. He's, and he's, he has volunteered, like I said, for decades. He's lived in this area for decades. He said the last time he had gotten uh, chiggers as bad as he has them now, it was in Southern Illinois. He didn't realize that they were a thing around here, but they, they are. Um, and now they are uh, very, very active. Um, and people, don't, when they talk about bites and getting bit up, they talk about things called noceums. Um, and there's a lot of different kinds of noceums. Oftentimes a noceum ends up being a type of a biting fly or a little gnat. Um, but when we're talking chiggers, um, I don't know if you notice that dot in the center of the screen, that's about the size of an adult chigger. And the ones that cause the problems, the larvae, are uh, one, uh, the adults are one fiftieth of an inch, the, uh, the larvae are one one hundred and fiftieth of an inch. Wee, teensy, weensy, tiny things. Um, this is what we're looking at. Now, chiggers are actually a mite. And if you, um, <clears throat> mites are arachnids, uh, ticks are arachnids. If you've ever seen a, a, a larval tick, uh, arachnids are, are notable because they have eight legs, um, but um, the mites um, and ticks, they go through a phase where um, they're a larva. And look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six. They only have six legs. Once they mature, they get eight legs, but uh, the larval stage, um, it's when they're the hungriest. It's when they need uh, to eat uh, the most. And that's actually uh, for these mites, that is when they take their only blood meal is in this phase right here, when they are so tiny that you need a microscope to be able to see them. Um, so you know, what they do, um, this is kind of an overview of that uh, timeline that would go with that diagram. Um, 
they uh, overwinter as adults uh, and they become active when the soil starts to warm up. It's, um, you know, here it says 60 degrees, but you know, uh, late springtime is usually when they start to become active. Uh, the female lays eggs on uh, vegetation, usually dense vegetation. Those eggs hatch in a little bit less than a week. And then there's actually a, a pre-larval stage where they're kind of, you know, getting ready to um, go out into the world, but they're not really doing much yet. It's that larval stage where they are called chiggers. And that's when they need to find a host. And it doesn't have to be a warm blooded host. It can be um, pretty much you know, anything that comes along that has blood, they'll, they'll jump onto it and um, they'll take their meal. Um, now, um, here's how it works. They, um, you may have heard that they burrow under your skin and that's not quite how they operate. They, um, they do have these um, piercing mouth parts and they will uh, latch onto your skin and they put these, um, it's kind of like a saliva, it's a digestive fluid that goes down into the hole that they've made. And your skin doesn't like that, so it reacts and um, it uh, creates this, this uh, kind of like a straw here um, that the uh, mite can then, uh, the jigger can then slurp um, your digested skin cells. It slurps it up. And then uh, when it's done feeding, uh, that uh, the remaining fluid uh, forms a little bit of a cap on the end. And that's a lot of times your fingernail will catch that. Um, and it, it's not, even though it looks disgusting and I don't know, as I'm, I don't know about you and I apologize uh, for, for throwing all this at you, uh, but it's, it's good information to have, knowledge is power. As we're talking about this, I am scratching and I am itching and I'm pretty sure that I got into some chiggers last weekend. Um, they uh, will, will not hang on for a long period of time, really just a day or two. <clears throat> and then they, they go on to the next stage and they don't feed on people anymore after that. Once they're uh, on their way, once they've got their eight legs, they mostly feed on, feed on uh, plant juices. So it's just in this very, very early stage <clears throat> now, you may have heard, uh, oh, you know, if you tuck your pant legs into your socks, um, then you won't, uh, you won't get bit. But um, that's, they are so tiny that they can actually get through the gaps and the spaces that are in between, <clears throat> you know, where your, your pants uh, go inside of your socks. Uh, in fact, a lot of times if you get a bunch of chigger bites, uh, a chigger will only bite you once, but you can have a lot of chiggers because they're so small. And um, you'll get these clusters of bites in an area. Um, now they um, are um, not, um, Deet will uh, repel them. Um, you, you can read some crazy things on the internet. People say, oh, you know, spray yourself with, uh, kerosene I read. Uh, you, you don't want to do something that's going to make you a potential fireball. Um, but uh, you, you can spray yourself with um, an insect repellent that contains DEET. Um, showering when you come back inside <clears throat> will definitely help. Make sure you rub everything because you can actually um, <clears throat> get rid of the chiggers if you can you know, wash them off. You might still get a, a little bit of a bite, but um, it won't be as bad as if they were allowed to uh, stay on for uh, a period of time. Um, the, all you, whatever you use to treat your itches, <clears throat> you can try that. Calamine lotion was the old school way. Hydrocortisone cream is actually pretty effective. Um, I, people always wonder, well, you know, this thing is sucking, it's eating my skin cells, am I going to get a disease? Really, the, the main danger with a chigger bite isn't so much something you'll catch from the insect, it's something you do to yourself. If you scratch excessively, you might um, infect your wounds. So you want to be, you know, kind of careful with that. Go with something that will remove the itch. 
Um, now, some people say, oh, you know what? Um, I always put nail polish on it. And that goes back to the belief that they're burrowing under your skin. Uh, they're, they're not burrowing. Um, nail polish, I guess, will cover them up. And it, um, some people say it kind of dries their skin out. I don't know, I don't even like putting nail polish on my nails. So the idea of putting it on my skin just doesn't appeal to me, but hey, if you've done it before and it works, keep, keep uh, like I said, go with your preferred anti-itch remedy. Um, but yeah, it is definitely, t with the, uh, the moisture that we've had, they, they are doing quite well. And um, you just wanna be prepared and, and be cognizant that uh, we've got chiggers. So um, let's go on to something maybe a little bit more pleasant. Um, our uh, creature feature this week is actually um, an insect that uh, you probably have encountered whether you realized it or not. Um, it's the, uh, the northern walking stick. These are uh, pretty common creatures in our area, but they are not commonly seen. And you can see why. Um, the times I've found northern walking sticks, it's been um, after a, a lot of wind or a, a rainstorm, something that's going to knock them down out of the trees. Now, uh, when I was uh, reading up on these bugs, I, I found out, and I thought this was so interesting, they actually were considered a, um, forest pest back in the 1800s, late 18, early 1900s, as um, you know, Illinois was, was settled, um, getting settled at that point, there was a lot of exploration going on, and um, uh, people were tracking uh, not only what species lived in the woods, but what species were harmful to the woods. And um, the uh, walking sticks were present in such great numbers that they were actually defoliating, defoliating uh, some of our uh, uh, woodland trees. And I just, I thought that was so interesting. That, that's from uh, the Illinois Natural History Survey. They don't usually make stuff up. If, if they're saying it's true, then it's true. Um, but it's just so, uh, um, I don't know, it seems odd to me because uh, while they're, they're not in any uh, they're not considered a rare insect by any point, uh, any means. Uh, they're not present in the sort of numbers that we would think of uh, being capable of, of uh, eating all the leaves on the trees. Uh, here we've got a mama and a papa. Now here is a female. Uh, and the difference of males tend to be really slim. But, you know, unless you've got them side by side, slimness, you know, size is always a difficult way to uh, gauge something unless you've got side by side for comparison. But uh, we can go to the uh, uh, posterior, I guess we could call it, the, uh, the, the hind quarters of the walking sticks. And you can see we've got uh, quite a bit of fanciness over here. That would be um, the mama. That's, that's Mrs. Walking Stick. And then here on the male, we have these clasping structures here. Uh, so uh, the papas and the mamas uh, get together, and um, this is, uh, I think, 18 and over is what we have this program set at, so I can say this. They actually, uh, the uh, organism that holds the record for the longest copulation period is actually uh, walking sticks. Once they clash together, sometimes they don't come apart for uh, days, um, and the result of that is um, walking stick eggs. So um, <clears throat> these are greatly enlarged. They've always kind of reminded me of black eyed peas in a sort of an opposite kind of way, but they've got a similar coloration. They are, um, they're quite small though. They are, they're bigger than a uh, chigger, but uh, you can see them with the naked eye. I would say they're, uh, you know, maybe a couple millimeters in size. Um, Female can produce about 100 eggs or so. And you'll notice they, the, the egg itself is dark, but then they've got this, this light colored stripe. Um, entomologists call that the capitulum. If you're a plant person though, you might um, consider it sort of the equivalent of the elisome, which we see on plant seeds. 
So either one of these words refers to uh, some uh, kind of tastiness that is added to, in the case of a plant, it's added to the seed. In the case of the walking stick eggs, it's added um, on the surface of the egg. This is to attract um, ants. Uh, an ant will sense this uh, bit of nutrition here. I think that's a combination of sugars and fats. And they will um, pick up these eggs and carry them down into their ant hill, uh, where they'll, uh, they'll lick off uh, or consume this uh, little band of nutrients. But then the egg gets tossed into the ant's waste pile, which is actually an ideal place for a baby walking stick to grow up, it's, um, or to, to hatch anyway. Um, it will uh, have some protection there from the elements. Uh, it, it doesn't happen with all the eggs, because remember, mama walking stick, she's way up high in the trees, unless she's been blown down in a storm. But she's going to be dropping these eggs from quite a distance. Uh, she offers no parental care at all, but sometimes there's a, a nice little relationship that develops with uh, local ants that uh, find these, um, these eggs and carry them back and offer them a means of protection uh, for when they grow up. We're going to come back to walking sticks again in a little bit. Um, but uh, I wanted to add a segment tonight um, called What's in the Freezer? Because we get so many things, uh, whether it's um, items that our uh, naturalist uh, and restoration crew has found when they're out working, or if it's members of the public that have found things in their yard. Um, Sometimes we get anonymous donations um, that are left on the, the front doorstep. Um, we, have to, we have to account for all of this. We actually uh, have what's called a, a scientific collection permit that's um, maintained through the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And that um, allows us to use these different items for um, uh, education purposes. Uh, and taxidermy is, is quite expensive, but uh, throwing something in the freezer doesn't really cost anything other than a little bit of space. So uh, I'm going to actually, I'm going to stop the screen share. I'm going to take us um, to our uh, speaker view here. And um, can everybody see me? Am I nice and large? Um, um, I am going to... Start with item A here. This kind of uh, goes back to, was it last week that we did the weasel? Um, we talked about the long-tailed weasel. Oh, tech support puppy thinks this is awesome. He wants to see what I've got here in the uh, bag. Um, we talked about long-tailed weasels. Uh, before and this is um, the other uh, member of the weasel family. Well, we've got minks, we've got long-tailed weasels, and then we've got this little guy here. This is a least weasel, and it's uh, you can see uh, when it met its demise, it was actually just starting to uh, change from its winter coat or pelage, which would be white, to its summer coat, which is dark. Um, brown. And it's tiny. You know, it looks like it's the size of a mouse, but it, it's uh, curled up a little bit. Um, anybody see that? Uh, it's got black on the end of the tail. <laughs> and um, here's the, uh, the fur that's starting to turn. Here's its little weaselly face. <laughs> and it's, um, you know, it's funny. Um, <coughs> Sorry, um, you'd think that these would be quite rare and hard to find, but I've seen more least weasels than I have long-tailed weasels, even though the long-tailed weasels are larger. Um, <coughs> they're, uh, when I first started volunteering at the Forest Preserve District, um, <coughs> someone found a least weasel. I gotta take a sip of water here. Uh, I. Uh, you had someone bring in a least weasel that had um, somehow gotten into their uh, bathroom and it had drowned in their toilet. Um, so 
that sort of started this this long history that I've had with these creatures. We've had them in the garage at uh, Hickory Knolls. Uh, I showed you guys that picture before. We've had them out at the Denny Ryan Service Center. Um, <coughs> they show up in people's sheds. Um, they're attracted to places where there's rodents, just like the long-tailed weasel is, but they're, um, they're smaller. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, I think I may have seen one last night. Um, I was walking home and there was a creature that uh, did not move like a chipmunk. It didn't have a tail that it shook. It uh, shot across a front step and it went underneath. Um, I didn't want to trespass, so I wasn't able to really um, get up close. But these, uh, these guys are, are more common than you uh, really think. And uh, we have one in our freezer. Now, uh, this other item, <laughs> by the way, don't tell anybody here at the marketing office that these are in the freezer. Um, I don't know. I'll probably have to uh, explain to them later what I'm doing with them here. But um, <laughs> this was um, an object that came to us uh, very late. Uh, actually, no, it was over the winter. Anybody see this? This is a baby northern water snake. Um, it was found, uh, unfortunately, it was found a little bit too late. This was found in the... Uh, uh, the water treatment plant downtown Batavia. A friend of mine, uh, James, works there, and um, he found this um, <laughs> coiled up in a corner. It was still alive at the time, but uh, it was just so uh, dehydrated that it wasn't really able to, uh, to survive. We tried to uh, put it <laughs> on a moist towel, um, see if we could kind of bring it back to life, but um, we weren't successful. <coughs> but the, um, I wanted you to see the markings on this are the giveaway for this species. Um, let's see if I can bring that up to the, can you see the bands <coughs> that go around its neck? And then as we go down the body, those bands become blotches. You see that? They do not match up anymore. See that spots? It goes from bands up here to spots down here. <laughs> and then it's got these little tiny half moons on its belly. Even though this thing is only about six inches long, it has everything you need to know to identify it as a northern water snake. And we have it here in our freezer. <laughs> now, remember I said um, that I might be distracted. Uh, I do have one more creature here that I wanted to share with you. This is a walking stick insect. Now, this actually is not um, the same kind that we I have in the wild here. Oh, she's going to do her thing here. Um, she's going to wave at you. Um, <coughs> when I first uh, started studying walking sticks, I found a, a couple that had blown down from a tree in a storm. And I wanted to create a display like I'd seen at another nature center. So uh, as it turned out, it was a male and a female. And they got together and they laid eggs. Um, but I could not get them to feed on anything. So I went back to the nature center where I'd first seen the walking stick display and I said, hey, what's your secret? How do you get these things to grow? And uh, she said, oh, well, we don't, we don't have native walking sticks. We have Vietnamese walking sticks. And I said, really? And she said, sure, you want some? So uh, I started, this was in 2000 and two or 2003, I can't remember exact, the exact year, but uh, with a gift of uh, about eight walking sticks from the uh, Wildwood Nature Center up in Park Ridge, I've been keeping uh, walking sticks now, um, well, for 17 years. Um, they can do, uh, walking sticks can do something that not every species can. They have a, a little, uh, trick called parthenogenesis, which means they can reproduce without a male. 
So um, this, remember how we said the, the, the female walking sticks doesn't have a clasping uh, organ on the back? Um, you can see, uh, well, maybe you can't. Hold on, let me see if I can get her to turn around here. Um, she just lays eggs and then those eggs hatch into more females about the time. She's at her mature size right now. And um, I'm not sure if she started laying eggs or not. Living in a terrarium, she doesn't need to have ants carry them away. They can survive quite fine on their own. Um, but uh, she'll lay, you know, maybe a hundred or so eggs. And of those, uh, sometimes a lot of them hatch, sometimes not very many. It kind of depends on if we've been good about keeping the substrate moist enough. But um, then she'll, uh, she'll die. And just about the time she's not around anymore, then the babies will start to hatch. And um, then the cycle will start all over again. This happens um, <laughs> about... Um, let's see, she's about oh, six months old now and it won't be too much longer. She'll be gone and then we'll have the babies. The babies start off um, not even a half an inch long <laughs> and then they grow and um, they will molt their skin, shed their skin. Uh, I believe it's five times to get to their uh, grown up size. And um, then uh, they'll mature and they'll lay eggs and they'll die and it'll start all over again. And this has been going on, as I said, for uh, about 17 years now. Um, I'm going to put her on her stick again and we'll just kind of marvel at her camouflage. Well, maybe we won't. Isn't that amazing? Now, there are a few differences between the uh, Vietnamese walking sticks and the uh, um, northern walking sticks. Size is similar. Um, she's maybe a slightly heavier body than our native walking sticks, but not by much. Um, she's got, you see those little horns up there on her head? She's got two little horns on the top of her head. Um, our native sticks do not have that. There we go. You can see them now. Just two little prongs sticking up. I don't know. I don't think they have a function. Um, but um, otherwise, she's very similar. Um, these guys do tend to be more brown, and our native walking sticks uh, color can vary. They can be, um, she's going into her stick posture. It's going to hold real still. Um, our native walking sticks can be brown like this or they can be green. Um, I don't know if she's going to do the, the sometimes when they're um, replicating a stick, a stick, you know, in a breeze, a stick is not going to hold perfectly still. And these uh, walking sticks don't either. They'll sometimes sway back and forth. Um, she is doing just about as good of a stick impression as you're ever going to see. I was going to see if I could get her back on her twig. Um, <laughs> just like our um, native walking sticks, which feed on hardwoods, our native walking sticks eat oak. Um, they prefer oak and cherry, wild cherry. Um, so do these guys, even though they're from a different country. Um, I can feed her, I feed her either black cherry or um, choke cherry leaves and she um, eats those in the winter time because we do they don't uh, hibernate or and we don't hibernate them um, is they don't go into a diapause the way our native sticks do um, <clears throat> we feed her um, or them <laughs> uh, romaine lettuce and they eat that quite nicely too um, now, there is one other thing I wanted to show you. Um, it's going to take me just a second to reach it here. Um, I mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of cool things in the freezer, and we'll probably go back in the freezer again another time. This actually was in the freezer. 
and now it's not. Um, you know, taxidermy is costly, but we're very fortunate to have a gentleman, a local gentleman, Paul Niesler, who um, uh, likes to uh, practice taxidermy. And he's actually, he prepared the mole, mole that we looked at. He prepared the mink that uh, we looked at last week. Um, and he prepared this as well. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a black squirrel. But it's, uh, it's not a, a rare or exotic species. It's actually just a very dark form of our local gray squirrels. Um, some of you might have black squirrels in your neighborhood. We, it seems like around the greater uh, Geneva and St. Charles area, we've got quite a few uh, black squirrels. And it, they seem to be somewhat cyclical, where we'll, we'll see a bunch, and then we'll go a while, and we won't see any, and then we'll see a bunch more. Uh, back when I first started volunteering at Tekka with the Woods uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was um, a fairly decent number of black squirrels up, that would be up in the Valley View area. Uh, I've seen them over by um, the St. Charles Library. Uh, I saw one once over by uh, in the Wild Rose area. This one actually came from uh, Peck Road. Um, just It was between... Uh, uh, Kesslinger and Caneville, a little bit um, past, uh, what would that be, uh, past the um, animal control facility as you're heading towards Caneville Road and Peck Farm. Uh, it, was, it had just been hit. Poor guy. I, I felt bad that he had to give up his life, but I also felt lucky that I had my scientific collection permit with me and I could turn the car around and stop it and uh, pick him up. Um, it's a, a big male squirrel. He's, he's, uh, gray squirrels um, are the smaller of the two species uh, of squirrels, tree squirrels that we have here. The fox squirrel uh, is generally, they weigh two pounds or so, and the gray squirrels average about one pound. But this guy was a little bit more than a pound. He was a pretty good size. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I got hit by a car, but uh, really didn't get um, too banged up at all. You can see the tail is still in great shape. Paul posed it in such a way. There's actually a little bit of a history. Uh, Paul had given us another black squirrel a few years ago. And as part of my duties as uh, outreach ambassador here, I uh, take mounts that we have out when I do uh, programs off site. Well, I had somewhat um, I don't know if you'd say typically or absent-mindedly, because I'm typically kind of absent-minded, but I had taken the black squirrel A and I'd set it on the roof of the park district van and uh, proceeded to drive off, forgetting that it was up there. I got back to the nature center, remembered what I'd done, turned around, went back, and um, found it. Um, now, ironically, that, that uh, Black squirrel had also been hit by a car. Um, and it, that's when Paul taxidermied it the first time. Well, it got hit by a car a second time after it fell off the roof of the van. Uh, by the time I got back to it, it literally had the stuffing knocked out of it and there really wasn't much left to it. But I uh, called Paul and I, I admitted what I'd done. And he actually thought the whole thing was kind of funny. And he said, well, you get me another black squirrel and um, I'll get you another black squirrel. So. Um, as luck would have it, um, I found this one, and it was, uh, Paul said it was almost exactly where he had found the first one. So uh, there seems to be a, a concentration of black squirrels uh, over there on uh, what would be the west, uh, far west side of Geneva. Um, but something, not everything stays in the freezer at uh, the Nature Center. Sometimes things get to come out and they get to be... Um, Taxidermied uh, for posterity. Now, um, I'm going to uh, ask you all, does anybody have any questions? Uh, I know some of you have um, been emailing me with different things that you've been seeing and hearing. Has anybody got any questions right now that you'd like covered? Hey, Pam? Yeah. Hi, uh, it's Laura. Um, I was just wondering, have you ever seen, we saw on, uh, in, back in, actually in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall, um, uh, like a, a white squirrel, kind of an albino, it looked like? Yeah. 
so, um, it's funny you say that, Laura. Um, so, uh, everybody, that's, that's Laura McKinsey. I don't know if you want to be anonymous or not, Laura, but... That doesn't um, matter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, there is actually uh, a white squirrel in St. Charles, even as we... Oh. Um, and it's, it's an albino. The people who have seen it have seen the white eyes. Um, and it's up um, kind of in the greater Primrose Farm area. Okay. Um, and so, so I, I've, I've heard about that one, and then I've heard about uh, up near uh, Hampshire Forest Preserve, there was one sighted last year. Cool. Also thought to be an albino. Um, and what blows my mind about this one up uh, uh, by Primrose Farm is that when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, it's going to be a goner because, um, yeah. black squirrels, you know, black squirrels, they can um, have a little bit of a hard time blending in, but if they learn to stick with the shadows, um, even in the wintertime, they say that they uh, have a little bit of an advantage because this dark fur can help keep them warmer. Huh. Okay. Okay. They have a really hard time blending in unless we have a lot of snow um then that might uh, serve to their advantage but anyway that that uh, primrose farm white squirrel has been around for now this is it's over two years old so uh -huh. really doing really well um and then i should probably also mention those the white squirrels of only illinois that's uh, downstate mm -hmm. Uh, from what I understand, those were an introduced, started off with a pair or maybe a small group, and I don't believe those are true albinos. I think they are um, squirrels with uh, dark eyes, but light fur, if I remember correctly. Cool. So, so yeah, um, the uh, I get some updates sometimes from the people that live up there in the, the general Primrose Farm area that... Um, they just took a picture of him back in June, so still hanging in there, which is um, pretty exciting. I'll have to search it out, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I, if I hear about it, I'll let you know. Thanks. That'd be awesome. All right. Well, other questions? Uh, Pam, can you hear me? Yes, Kim. Yeah, hey, Kim. Um, do you know it's National Moth Week? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> in yeah. <laughs> International, right? Isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think it's International Moth Week. Huh? International uh, Moth Week. Yes. Oh, what happened? Um, well, um, oh. whoa, what happened? Oh, there, look at that. <laughs> uh, wow. I'm viewing Mary Tebow screen. Switch to share. How interesting. Wow. I don't know what we're going. <laughs> Tech support help me here to, to straighten us out. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's funny you say that, Kim, because I always like to give a little bump to what we'll be talking about next week. Um, but I did, let's see if I have it here. Um, I did have a little update to share. Um, we'll go into more depth next week, but we're, our main feature will be on the Imperial Moth next week. And then... Um, Let's see if I can hold this up. Can you see this? I'm trying to get you pulled up. It's hard to get the lighting right on these things. So it looks, I know what it looks like, but that's not what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's not from the freezer either. This is the pupa of that gypsy moth caterpillar that I'd found mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. Um, next week, we're going to do an update on gypsy moths. Um, we got some activity that I thought you might be interested to see. Now, I don't know that this is going to uh, develop anymore. I think it got too dried out, but uh, I thought it was interesting. So a, a caterpillar that's about an inch and a half long makes a pupa that's um, about three quarters of an inch long and doesn't um, uh, you know, spin any, any cocoon or anything. And um, this, uh, would have hatched if it was a male gypsy moth, it would be able to fly it. If it was a female, it would not. Um, I don't want to give too much away about what we're going to talk about next week, but I've got some cool video about what's going on um, in front in our bur oak tree. Um, oh, and the other thing I wanted to say is that Doug Ptolemy's current book is Nature's Best Hope. 
Nature's best hope. Thank you, Kim. Well, and so Kim Haig is, is um, uh, one of the uh, outstanding members of no Northern Cane Wildlands, which is if you're into native plants or even if you're thinking about getting into native plants, you want to know about Northern Cane Wildlands. And um, Wildlands was going to host Doug Tallamy just at the start of uh, the quarantine, wasn't that right, Kim? Right, April, right, in April. In April, he was going to come up to, he was going to be at the auditorium at um, Elgin yeah. Community College. El Elgin Community College, yeah. Yeah, and um, unfortunately, he had to pull the plug on that, although I think, right. isn't there a YouTube version of his speech from? There, are, there is, yes. Um, yes. But yeah, his, his idea of taking our yards and kind of uh, putting them together uh, like a quilt so that we've each are, are doing our part to bring back the native vegetation instead of just leaving it up to public agencies to restore. If we can each do just a small part, we can uh, create or recreate um, our largest national park, which is a, just a really cool concept. I'm sure once, you know, I don't know what our new normal is going to be, but hopefully he'll be able to come back to this area. And, yeah, I hope so. More about um, what his ideas are. Hey, Pam, there, um, yeah. there was an article, I think, um, in the April of Smithsonian uh -huh. uh, do dedicated to uh, Doug Tallamy. And it gave a great overview of his what he was thinking, uh, some people who were kind of against what he was thinking. But it, 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 it's really quite inspiring if people are interested in looking that up. I think okay. it was around the Earth Day issue, I think. It was, yeah. Yeah. We will take that out. Um, and yeah, um, nature's best hope. Um, well, and I'd like to hear what the cases against it are because I mean, might, you know, if you could tell or not, I'm kind of pro, uh, you know. Well, there was one. In an area. Yeah, towards the end of the article, there was one um, person who was saying, uh, he was based in California, that the invasives that are, you know, planted, that the insects are doing a good job at adapting to the invasives. Um, and so I didn't really agree with it, but, you know, it's just a counterpoint. Well, and there is, there actually, I believe it's called One Million Trees. Um, there's a, there's an, I, I clicked on this website. This was a, a while back and I thought, oh, you know, a million trees, that sounds great. Well, it turns out that it is um, a, a California group and they are strongly opposed to replacing like the eucalyptus and some of those species that have become naturalized in uh, Southern California um, because of just what you said, Laura, that they're, um, uh, the, the, Wildlife has become uh, used to having these non-natives there, and to rip them out um, is going to do more harm than good. We and we hear that sometimes around here. Um, say our restoration crew is in, and they're cutting, uh, they're cutting out buckthorn. I, I remember having a uh, sort of a heated discussion with a gentleman one time who said that he had seen bobcats uh, in an area, and that what we were doing was destroying the, the habitat because bobcats like dense uh, undergrowth and um, that you know, what we were going to do was not going to um, you know foster any secretive species like that and well sometimes you got to look beyond what the immediate look is and go you know keep in, in mind what the goal is and that is to um, get back the plants that are adapted to this particular area um, whether it's our temperatures or our rainfall, um, our soils play a big role as well. Um, and it's kind of like if you're just like uh, Aldo Leopold said, you know, if you um, got to try and get all the pieces and, and put them back together, a lot of times we find some are missing and are never going to come back, but we try our hardest to do that. Um, any other questions tonight? Um, I tell you, a tech support puppy is down here. I don't know. I mean, he's, uh, he's dying to get us. We'll just have him say a quick hello. He uh, is dying to uh, see what else we've got in the freezer tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note, we'll say goodnight for now.
And uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, we'll do a wrap up of um, a couple of moth items and uh, I've got a couple of bird items as well for next week. So hopefully we'll see y'all then. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thank Pam. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Say bye, Bo. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Hey, guys. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, See you Pam. next week, Laura. <laughs> Get a drink of water. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hello.